Lord, we just thank you for the cross. Come on, let's give him a clap. We're so amazed at what you have done for us. The cross, the power of God to salvation. Oh, we thank you and honor you, Jesus. You're the best. Oh, you're the King of kings and Lord of lords. You've been given a name above every other name. We bow at that name of Jesus. We give you all the honor, Lord. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. So we started to get to asking questions and then it never stopped. <laughs> okay, so we want to talk about ministering deliverance. And uh, so I will give you some step by step, but please, this is a life flow with the Holy Ghost. So it's okay to have approaches and methods, and there's lots of different ways that people go about doing things. So learn from them, but flow with the Holy Ghost. The sons of Sceva tried to copy the method. They watched. Okay, we command you in the name of Jesus that Ian is preaching about. <laughs> and even said, who are you? You know, I remember there was a situation, a move of God and deliverance, and, the, and, and so various people come up to pray, and the demon cried out, who are you? <laughs> you better have an answer when they say that to you. And, and the guy said, I'm the chairman of the camp committee. Wrong beep. <laughs> That's not going to work. <laughs> I think step back, sir. <laughs> oh my goodness! These are so much. I love deliverance. There's so much fun in it all. So many stories. So, uh, what, so I'm going to give you an outliner of the approach that I use, but I flow intensively with the Holy Spirit. I tend not to lean on the method, uh, but I understand spiritual alignment. So I'm all into spiritual alignment, bringing people in a place where they can receive an experience, and I have some steps that I use in it. The dilemma if you have a method is you'll unconsciously lean on your method to get you the results instead of operating in faith that God will come and touch the person. That's, I can't overestimate, uh, uh, emphasize that enough. It is really important. It's by faith we are able to do this. It's not by the methodology. And so I found that because of that, I try to bring the alignment as best I can, but I don't have big prayers that people read because I found personally it feels like a method and I feel like the heart's never in it. So I try to keep it dynamic and alive and with the person understanding how we're working together for this process. Because then they walk away and they learned. They understood something. Then when they share their testimony, they can help other people into it. Okay? So, so uh, anyway, let me just, I'll just give you one verse. We'll start with one verse in Luke, Luke 9, 11. Just, uh, it says, Jesus received them, spoke to them of the kingdom of God, and healed them that had need of healing. Isn't that an interesting thing there? He said he received them. That means to make the people very welcome. In spite of their needs and problems and all sorts of things, it's important to welcome people, to receive them not as cases, <laughs> as people. They're people. So love the people. And, you know, I, I'm always a bit nervous before every ministry thing because I, I need God to come. He doesn't come. What am I going to do, you know? <laughs> so, we need God to come. So he welcomes. So, so make people welcome. They often come apprehensive. They don't know what's going to happen. So just welcome them, smile, and make them feel relaxed. Create a, an environment where they can feel safe and relaxed where ministry is not forced on them or pressured on them, where this is a journey, and on the journey we're working together to get an outcome. Never, never drop into the thinking, I've been here, done that, know what to do, I can fix you kind of thing. It's very easy if you've been around the ministry a while to lean on your experience rather than lean on the Lord. So you can draw from experience, but you don't lean on it. So he welcomed them. Notice there he taught them the kingdom of God. So he explained kingdom principles. And so as I'm doing the preparation work, and I'll show you exactly how I do it, uh, I will also instruct them as well. So they, once I've got 
identify what's going on, then I help them understand what Jesus has done and their part in it and so on. Don't be long teaching. It's just very simple, maybe one verse. And uh, so he, and then he ministered to them. He healed them and, and set them free. So you know, I like the fact that Jesus, first of all, was concerned about people and loved them and created an environment where they could be received and welcomed. Uh, secondly, he actually used the opportunity to teach them and help advance their understanding of the kingdom. And then finally, he ministered to them. And of course, he didn't do it always that way, but I like that verse because it outlines that. So you have authority. God has given you authority. Nothing's going to harm you. Luke 10 and verse 19, he said, I give you authority. I give you authority to tread on scorpions and serpents and all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall harm you. I give you authority. So you have authority. It means the legal right to be God's representative there, to speak and act on his behalf as though he would be. Now, here's the thing. Uh, there's two words used there. One's authority, one's power. Authority means I'm authorized. Someone sent me. I'm authorized to do this. And so you always stay within the realm what God authorized you to do. Don't be presumptuous. Uh, and then power. We need the power of the Holy Ghost to flow. Dunamis power of the Holy Spirit to flow. And the picture, probably the best way to look at it is like this. If you were to have a policeman step out on the road in front of you and hold his hand up, you're wearing a uniform, you'll stop. You'll first get a fright and then you'll stop. Now, in fact, you could put your foot down and just run him clean over. <laughs> However, if you do that, because you're driving the car and he's just standing on the road. However, if you do that, it's not the individual you've come up against. It's the whole weight of government. Now, everyone is after you. You understand? So, so the policeman himself is just the representative of a governmental authority. So when you're going to minister deliverance, you realize whatever weaknesses, lacks, or shortcomings or struggles you have, you put on your uniform to be God's policeman. You're now not coming in your own name. You're coming in the name or as the representative of another. So, so this means that at any, any believer can do that. And you say, well, I've, I've got this. No, 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 don't worry about all the stuff you've got and where you are and what you can't do. God has authorized you to help people. So at the level you've got freedom, help others into that. And, of course, in, in other countries, the policeman has a gun, so he can, has the power to stop you. So he has the authority, that's the uniform, and the power, the gun. And he can just shoot you and stop you, just like that. So for you, as coming as a representative of the Lord, if you're rightly aligned in your personal life, then even if it's only to a measure, you're still able to work with the Lord in this. He will bring to you people at the stage you're ready to work with. You have to understand God's wanting you to grow and learn. So you don't have to worry about this. If it's outside your, your scope, then it's outside your scope. You refer it on. You just say, that's beyond me, but I could help with this. And I found, like, I've taught my nine-year-old daughter, 11, or she's about nine or 11, over to Indonesia, got her in a big meeting, and we had a massive altar course. They go, well, get praying for people. And, and she got praying. Well, she had this guy, Indonesian, can't speak a word of English, Indonesian woman, suddenly yell out her in English, I hate you, I want to kill you. In a man's voice. It's a woman in a man's voice. She just says, in Jesus' name, come out. It didn't even come out. <laughs> so it didn't matter she was 9 or 11, whatever it was. Her age didn't matter at all. It was what she was carrying as the representative of God. So you've got to stop. The devil will try and condemn you and show up all your weaknesses and faults just to get you to withdraw from your authority. So if God brought the person to you, do what you can and then refer them on. Just like the good Samaritan, you know, how he picked him up and they did what he could. Then he put him into the community or into the inn where the rest of the care could take place. So just do what you can. And you'd be amazed how God will bring people to you. If you're willing, man, they're out there. Haunted houses abound. Tormented people abound. They're just needing someone who's not afraid to talk up about it. And give it a go. I gave it a go and I didn't know a thing. And I'm still giving it a go. And all sorts of stuff happen. All unusual things happen. Oh, I've got time to have it to get onto this and finish this. It's just so much to share on all these things. Anyway, okay. So, so the first, we'll break it up into two phases. First of all, the preparation phase, uh, which involves diagnosis and laying out what, you, what you're going to do. And then the second is just the ministry phase. 
So that's how I work it. I always work it that way, and because I found it really helpful, and uh, it just has worked for me well. So in the diag- and, and and so a, a tree is known by its fruit. The fruit tells you the root. So what I'm looking for, people come and they've got all the stuff that's happened to them, unbelievable stuff, and you, you think, my God, it's such a mess. Now, if you look at it, actually, it's this happened, and then that happened, and then this they happened, and then they did this, and they did this, and that happened. And so there's like layers built up, built on something. And, I, and so because perhaps because of my physics background, I tend to think, and I'm looking in, an, in, a, in a what you call forensic mode, diagnostic mode, just looking to find out what are the possible causes of the thing that's happened. That's how I think. I just I go into it with that kind of thing. So, so the first thing, step then, is depend on the Holy Ghost. God knows what's there. You depend on him to bring it out somehow, some way. Maybe you get a, a word of knowledge or prophetic thing. Maybe the person suddenly remembers. Oh, I just remembered. And you, they share it and you think, my God, how did you forget that? It was so big. <laughs> anyway, there it is. So, so depend on the Holy Spirit. You've got to lean into God. And so don't rush the, the, the time there of talking. Just ask the Holy Spirit to help show what's there. And then I always keep a pad with me and take notes. Because if I don't, I'll forget what's all come up. And in the talking, you've got to look for the roots in the middle of the talk. Because you hear a lot of stuff. But if you know what you're looking for, the moment it triggers, you'll, oh, that's it, that one there. And I'll show you that in a moment. See, so, so, so we made the person welcome. We lent and asked the Holy Spirit to come and help us. Now we're going to ask questions. You're going to ask questions. Now, I pray almost every day without exception for an understanding heart to judge. This is the same prayer that King Solomon prayed. Lord, give me an understanding heart or a hearing heart that can discern or, or can, uh, can judge these matters. Because I don't know. They're, they're too, he's saying it's all too big for me and there's all these issues to solve Give me an understanding heart to be able to judge. Now, of course, it's the judges who are the deliverers because they saw the law. They knew the law and the rights and wrongs of the law. So you find in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it was the judges were raised up as deliverers. Yeah, isn't that interesting, eh? Anyway, so to judge. So that's in 1 Kings 3, 9. And God spoke to him and reflected it back. And it says the Lord was pleased with his request because he asked for an understanding heart to discern justice. So he said, give me an understanding heart to judge. God said, oh, I like what you've asked for, an understanding heart to discern justice. God is a God of justice. These are legal violations. And he's saying, oh, you've asked a very good thing. I'll give you everything else because you've asked the most important thing at all. You've asked what's near to my heart, how to bring justice to this person. It's something you don't hear a lot of in in the church. Emphasize grace. Don't emphasize justice. And justice is the, the pain in the community now, injustice. You know, that's a side thing. So, so I pray for that every day. Lord, today, give me a heart of understanding. Give me a wise and understanding heart. Understanding what's happening, a hearing heart. Lord, open my ears to hear. Give me the ability to ask the questions. I want that because this is too difficult without God helping. So instead of waiting till you're in the meeting with people, ask God for a hearing heart. Lord, give me a hearing heart. Open my ears to hear. Let me hear the cries of people's hearts. Lord, give me an understanding of what's going on inside them. Help me to ask questions that will find the root of the problem. See? So I I pray that pretty well every day as part of surrender to the Lord because I I need to have that to do what I'm doing. Okay. So so when you're asking questions, well, it's just a flow. Well, I just ask, what's the problem? Tell me. Tell me your story. What is it you're struggling with? And so I ask the problem and what they're struggling with, and they'll share a little bit, but I try to keep it focused with questions. So, well, when did that start? Because when it started, often there's something happened around that time. So when when the question, when did this start to happen? When did you start to experience these things? If they say, well, I've had them all my life, then it's obviously a generational issue. Let's talk about your parents and what was there. So we start to explore the parental thing and so on. And so, uh, or if it started, I said, well, what happened to you about that time? Oh, oh, this happened about that time. And they haven't seen the connection between the problem and what happened about the time it started. It's like there's a spiritual dullness over it. And the moment you ask the question, well, what happened? Oh, okay, what happened about then? Oh, this, anything happened in your family? Anything happened? And, And suddenly they remember. 
and they weren't able to connect. That happened, and now I've got this problem, and it's growing. So I just take a note of those things. I, I just jot down things that come up, and I'm looking for essentially the things I shared of the doors of entry. I'm looking, first of all, is this a generational issue? Let's talk about your father and your mother and the generational things that may have been there. I look for, is there a, is there a bitterness against the parents? Because this is going to be the source of problems. I, I cannot emphasize enough how unresolved issues with a father or a mother produce a life cycle of problems in people and their relationships. And they just don't see it that they've got bitterness, they've got judgments, they've made inner vows, they've made those things. So I look for the generational area, I look then for the relationship with the father and the mother, and then in telling the story, then you start to pick up other things that have happened, traumas that have happened, you pick up, and you're looking for the things that I shared before. You're looking for the events which have been a trigger for things to happen and how they've behaved. Was there any was sexual relation? It's a sexual problem. Okay, the first thing then was how long did this, when did this first start? Oh, it was when I was a little child. Well, that's abnormal. That's a generational thing. This is a hidden secret sin. Oh, there was this happened and after that this came. Okay, well, let's just talk about that. And so it's like you just ask questions to bring out, are there any legal rights? Are there any wounds and traumas that are doors of entry that's what I'm looking for and then how do they respond to cope with it and the way they try to cope that usually tells you a lot about the sin patterns that are built in their life and so you know you, you look at someone struggling with addiction well well addiction's never there in isolation addiction is always a result of very deep pain and often a lot of shame and so that's got to do with family so as you start with the addiction, which is the presenting problem, but it goes down, there's something else at the root of it. And uh, often you find there's deep traumas in the home, the family, sometimes traumas uh, during their, their being carried in the womb. Sometimes they were unwanted from within the womb, never bonded, and those kind of things. So as you will start to study a, a little more, this is just a foundational course, and uh, uh, some of the other speakers will touch these areas. As you start to study about the heart and the kind of wounds of the heart, the areas of wrong beliefs, bitter judgments, inner vows, burdens people carry. As you start to learn about those, you start to pick them up and recognize them. So that's all I'm looking for. Holy Spirit, help me to see what's important for today. I don't need to fix everything today. We just need to see what you're on at this time. So I, those are the things I'm looking at. Has there, have, are they having paranormal experiences? And some have, and they don't, don't always talk about it. But frequently you find women have been having paranormal experiences, sexual things happening or being touched or, or choked or whatever, and there's obviously something in the occult realm is operating. When did it start? Oh, when I was a little child. Oh, it's probably in your family then. Did you have something happen to you? Were you molested? So you, you're asking questions to discover what is going on. You want to see the journey and where legal rights were established for demons to come in. That's, that's really simply what it is. And, uh, and so I, I usually take about an hour to do that, and I just listen to the story and keep asking the questions and identify the key areas where there would be demonic doorways, starting at generational, then looking at bitter roots related to father and mother and unresolved conflicts there, then trauma experiences, and, and so on. So that's what I'm looking for. Then their actual sin, they've been involved in this or that, numerous relationships, and many people have got no understanding how it is built progressively to where they're in such a state now. There was this, or then there was this, then there was this, then there was this. And I think, well, actually, you see, there's actually a growing pattern where you've now built a habit and a pattern in this area. So that's, I kind of use that sort of approach to it, and I just take notes on it. Are there any soul ties? So the various things that I talked about in terms of uh, doorways, the generational, the occult, the uh, you know, false religions, idolatry, the bitterness and hatred, sexual sins, those kind of things, soul tries and trauma experiences. I just keep in the back of my mind, any one of those things could be an issue and I know how to deal with each one of those. So let's listen to their story and find what's there. That makes sense? Yep. And, and just it, un, it unrolls. It's quite surprising what people remember as they talk because it's the first time someone has encouraged them to talk. Like I had one, I talked about it. I said, have you ever had this kind of thing happen at night of, of feeling hands on you or touching? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then suddenly they come out and they talk and, and there's been this massive demonic defilement, massive. It's, it's actually why they've got the problem. 
because they're too ashamed to tell anyone. They think they're crazy when they describe their experiences. And, and not only that, they're so defiled by it. They hate themselves trying to stop it and shut it all out. So when, they, when you say, oh, it's okay, I understand that. This is what that is. Oh, then they talk about it. And then you can go through the process of ministry. Okay, so the first part of it is just hearing the story. You know, a lot of people have never had anyone listen to their story. And so when they tell their story, I'm watching for the, the shifts in their countenance to see what emotions are there. And I'll often interrupt the story because whenever you touch the heart, the emotions will come. And so when the emotions come, then I'm looking for, well, what just triggered that? So I might stop the questioning and just look straight in at that issue. Oh, I see you're feeling this. What are you feeling? I might even stop and just say, hey, what are you feeling right now? And they say, I'm really feeling a lot of grief or I'm feeling uh, angry. Okay, let's talk about that. And so we just stop and go a little further because that's what God is on. Something has triggered their heart. And so I, I get them to listen to what they're feeling because for many of them, they've never done that. And up it starts to come. And then, out, and then you, you start to find things. It's amazing how it just comes out to the light. It's just extraordinary how things just surface. And, uh, and, and the immense pain. But you've got to stop it rambling. Keep it sort of focused around the key things. And, uh, and so on. So when I've done that, um, then I've got a kind of an overview of what's sort of there. And, and I'll then look at it and highlight things. So now in all the things I wrote down, there's actually these areas I need to address. So when we've gone that far, I'll say, well, look, let me talk to you now about how to prepare yourself for ministry. So frequently I don't pray for the person uh, or do much ministry in the first session. I'll often do it over two sessions because I found quite good to give them a bit of homework. So I talk to them and share with them the key foundations. Look, I said, there's some things were done to you that will require you acknowledge the pain and forgive the people. Let's talk about that. And then I'll say, there's parts you've played in this. You actually need to repent and stop doing that and break all your agreement with. So in using simple language, I go through the R's of freedom. Recognize, take responsibility, uh, repent, release, and receive forgiveness, renounce. And uh, when it comes to ministry, we'll talk about resist. So I just help them understand this is what we're going to do now, and this is how we're going to minister. And then I'll give them a bit of homework. And uh, I give homework a lot. Uh, they, I've got no one now. If you come to him for counsel, you get homework. It's not because he's a teacher and he loves giving kids homework, you know. <laughs> Ken's laughing at that. Yeah, oh, yeah, sure. Recognize, responsible, responsibility, repentance, receive and release forgiveness, renounce or break agreements, and then resist. Later on, you need to, after it's all over, we'll talk about in one session how to walk, how to stay from free, but you need to renew your mind and, uh, and uh, rebuild your ways of operating. You know, we'll get to that. I don't want to complicate it. So those are the R's I use. I just have them in the back of my mind all the time. Because, and it's easy to help them. Look, okay, do you see or recognize this is what's going on? Are you willing to recognize this is their part, here's your part? You need to take full responsibility for your part. What they've done is their stuff. We're going to talk to you about how you can be free of your stuff. So the things that were done to you, the done against you, the way you were treated, that's outside our power, but resolving how you reacted to it is in your power. And they, people like to have it laid out clearly like that because now this is your part. If you will deal with this part, then you'll start to break free of all this injustice that was done. Sometimes just to say, in particularly church situations, that was wrong. You know, as a church leader, I want you to know that was really wrong how you were treated. It was ungodly how you were treated. That does not represent our Father, and it grieves him that you were treated that way. And then when I come to minister, I'll often stand as a church leader or a male or as a father and just take ownership of it and bring it to the cross. And sometimes that's enough to trigger a whole lot of stuff up. 
Anyway, so, so the homework. Now, the homework, mostly the homework I give people is, the, is to sit and uh, work through the process of forgiveness. Because I found hurrying forgiveness is often counterproductive. Because frequently there's been a lot of stuff and the person needs a bit of space to actually recognize the depth of pain in their heart. So all my homework pretty well involves uh, working through for forgiveness. So I say, now here are the people that you have got unresolved conflicts with. And this is what first your father, then your mother, and then there may be other people. Help them understand that. So now you need to actually face the pain and resolve it. So the anger letters, I show them how to do it. It's never to be given to anyone. You can bring it to me or you can destroy it before you come. Do not send it or give it to anyone. And uh, I had one recently. I may have forgotten that. <laughs> because next time I saw them, oh, I got all the family together and I read out my letter to my dad and mum. I'm thinking, no! <laughs> that must have been the Holy Ghost. Because she said, they broke down and wept and asked forgiveness. And all the family broke down because no one's been talking. You're the first one to bring it out. And we're glad now we can all talk. I'm thinking, oh God, now you, do, you saved my bacon that day. That was amazing. So you just have to lean on those. So I try to remember. Don't leave it lying around. <laughs> this is private. This is you with God working out what's in your heart. It's private. And even when they do a letter, unless they ask me to read it, I don't. Because it's a, it's a transaction of the heart. It's letting their heart freely speak. This is what happened. This is how I feel. And this is how I've tried to cope with it and the effect it's had on my life. So I break it into two parts. Honor your father and your mother. Honor your father for the first, the things that are good, things you can say thank you for, things that, are, that have contributed to your life. Because if you fail to honor, then you're going to have this problem in your life. Ephesians 6 verse 2. So I said, and then the second thing is then once you've done that, you'll be free inside to look at the other, but it may take a bit of time. And some ask for more time. I've had some, so I'm not ready yet for ministry. Meaning, I, I'm not ready even to face the pain, let alone forgive. So I just give them the time. So you just contact me when you're ready in your heart and you know it's now time for freedom. So I'm not rushing and making it a mechanical thing. We're trying to stay in a flow with the Holy Spirit. But I will follow them up with a text and see how they are and what's happening. Okay, so the homework part I have found very important. Here's why the homework's important. The first reason is it gets them proactive in between the counseling sessions. It means they're working on their life with God while they're not with you. That takes the emphasis off the counseling and onto the process. Otherwise, it's all about you and what you're going to do. So I found homework is very important just because it focuses them on working on their life with God during the period when they're in between meeting with you. The second is it causes them to have to take ownership of their life. This is something you're responsible for. You're getting power back in your life as you now face things you didn't want to face. So I, I found that very, very helpful. And three, it gives the Holy Spirit an opportunity to bring things up that they had not remembered in the time we spoke. Eh? And uh, so when we first, so, so that's it. That's the preparation process. And so I can usually do that in about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, but I, it's often within the hour. But it just depends on how complex and how worked out the thing is. But I just try to get it. Let's see if I can find it. Now, some I will pray for straight away. It's just a prayer situation. It's quite simple. But many that come, by the time they come to me, they've got massive stuff. I get the ones that no one else wants to deal with. So it might, that's why I have to have a sort of a way of crying about it. And uh, that doesn't take, take me days and days and weeks and weeks. And I tell them, I'm not going to be going to this for a long time. I'll do it and give you keys. I'll help you. We'll pray for you. We'll set you on the right path. But you're, you're, I'm not going to be a, a full-time counselor for you. This is actually a ministry encounter. I'm here to prepare you to, present, to get you right with God and start yourself on the journey. The rest of the healing will be in the process and the journey with other believers. Any idea? They're not meant to do it all yourself. 
So anyway, so, so I found that as a big help. That gets, so round one really is to meet with them, hear their story, identify the key features in it, and uh, then get them to do the homework preparation, may even give them a scripture to pray over their life daily. But my, primarily, it's the heart stuff that I get them looking at. And then I just let them go until they're ready to meet. Sometimes it's the following week. Sometimes it's a bit longer than that. Sometimes I say, look, so much has come up. I'm still processing and writing those letters. Some of them have got a number of letters. And anyway, so that's, that's what I get them to do. And then, now, and then also, before I meet them now, I can go back to the notes and no matter how long it takes, I've still got the outline of what the key issues will be. Otherwise, I forget it. I don't remember anything anyone tells me when it comes to counselling. You know, I just don't. It's like a grace. I meet you. I hear all the stuff. We're totally present. And afterwards, what? Yeah, yeah, I think I remember praying for you. Yeah. Uh, what was it about again? You know, it's just a grace not to... When I look at people, I don't want to see problems. I just want to see a lovely person, you know. It's a great grace to not remember. That's why I have to write it down or I definitely won't remember. So when I write it down, then I can pray over it before I meet them and ask the Holy Ghost to help with each area and just focus it and bring it into clarity. So before I meet again, I'll go through our notes and then highlight or bring on another sheet what it is I'm going to pray into. So I'm focused as I go into that, that, that encounter. They're not complex stuff. Anyway, no one taught me to do it. This is what I do, and it seems to work well. People keep coming back. <laughs> anyway, okay, so now we get to the ministry area. So in the ministry, great, they come back in, and uh, so we arrange the next appointment. Now, if it's a woman, I've always, I never pray for anyone, any woman alone. There's massive issues around all of that. So never pray for any woman alone. I always have another woman present. Uh, it's either my wife or someone from staff. Uh, uh, if I counsel a woman or have time to talk with them, then it's, it's always visible or open. But I, I'm not going to be caught because I, ha I had one situation there where the woman manifested a demon, started to tear her clothes off. Fortunately, my wife was with me. We were able to restrain her and stop her. And, I, and, I, and the Lord spoke to me then, see how easy it is for you to then be discredited and disempowered in your ministry. So... This is, not a, this is not a game to take lightly. This is something you need. It's a warfare, and the devil will use everything he can against you. So having a person with you means there's accountability for what you've done and said, and there's also accountability for the person and how they've responded. So if they try to lie about what took place, there is a witness present. So you have an outline of where you're going, and you have someone who's with you who saw and was there and saw the whole process. Does that make sense? It just is a really... Just keeps it safe. It's safe for me, safe for you. This is safe. This is good. Good boundaries and keeps it healthy. <laughs> and uh, so then we just, the first thing I do then after we've got together like that is I ask them uh, how they got on with the homework. <laughs> oh, you didn't do your homework. Why are you coming back? Because this is your life and your problem and you won't work on yourself. It's like wanting to play an instrument and you won't do the practice. It's like, I actually talked to them straight. I said, look, I, look, I tell you what, I'll just pray for you now, but I'll, and I'll talk to you again why the homework is important. I'll just remind you of it again, and then I'd like you to go and do the heart preparation. I, I'm, and no one ever, I've had, it's been a long time since anyone didn't do their homework, because by the time they get to me, they really are in bad shape. They're, <laughs> help me, you know, but I'm just helping them as a minister of God. Take responsibility. So I just ask about the homework, and then I ask them what came up, what the Holy Spirit show you. Because this is a journey with God. So just be open to see what the Holy Spirit's doing. And maybe something new came up that you hadn't heard before, or maybe he's really brought out the depth of pain. I asked them how they got on with the letter to, to, to process their forgiveness. And I get a bit of dialogue to talk and let them front up where they are. I want to meet them where they are. Adam, where are you? See? Who's, who you're listening to, what is influencing you. I want to have their heart before I get into ministry. Okay, then uh, I'll explain to them how we're going to minister. I said, these are the issues I have found that now we need to take you through. And here's the process. I will lead you in a prayer. The prayer will involve positioning yourself before the Lord, then dis removing the legal rights. I'll pray a prayer for you, just a sample prayer, show you what it's like. And, uh, and then what we'll do is this. At the, after you've prayed the prayer, I'll lay hands on you. Is that okay to lay hands on you? Just on the head or on the shoulder. Ask permission. Don't assume you can lay hands on people. 
Just ask permission. It's okay, if I lay hands on you to pray, it's partly the impartation of power, then this is what I will do. I will then begin to speak, and I will be speaking sometimes to you. It'll be in this kind of tone of voice. Sometimes I'll speak into bondages or something else. I'll use a different level, and I'm speaking to someone else. And here's how I want you to respond. Just resist those things and breathe out. So, so this is what I'll do. This is what you'll do, and this is how you respond in the ministry. If anything comes up that you'd like to talk about, just talk to me. So in other words, it's not just a, you know, just you doing something. It's actually we're, we're working together for this freedom. Okay? So that's how I do it. And then so then we'll, we'll lead them through the prayer. Now, the prayer is a prayer to dismantle legal rights. Now, I don't like to pray set prayers because the situations all vary so much. So I like to be led by the Holy Ghost. But... I have a pattern, and the pattern is very easy to remember because it's all those R's. <laughs> so once you memorize the R's, it's quite easy to pray, except I start with something else first. Here's how I would start. I start with them positioning themselves aligned with Jesus Christ. So the prayer would go something like this. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I confess Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. Now, this is... This is like being in a witness box testifying where you are. I confess Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ from every curse, all iniquity, every evil spirit. I belong to Jesus Christ, body, soul, and spirit. Now that is a testimony in a witness stand who I am. It's an announcement to the demons that I belong to Jesus Christ and I am redeemed. So I'm coming under the blood of Christ. Prior to setting that prayer up, I, I more frequently now, I pray uh, another prayer. I just overlooked it. I'm sorry. So prior to leading them in that prayer positioning, I'll often pray a prayer concerning the ministry time now. Because I find often there's a lot of stuff goes on in terms of demonic reactions. And I've had heaps of it. And I just, uh, just be a soldier, tough up boy. And, uh, and I <laughs> go through it. And, and it becomes, it's actually well known in Asia. Whenever I go up there, they have problems before I get there big time. You know, stuff breaks out. Things happen. Material, equipment breaks down. Cars break down. Every kind of thing happens. And, and uh, it's, I just got used to it now. You know, it's just unbelievable stuff would happen. I went to one island. I remember just every time I'd go to my room to pray, the power would blow in the room. You know, how does that happen? I'm the only room in the whole flipping camp. Every time I get to pray and prepare, the power goes out and I've got someone in there fiddling with it instead of robbing my time with God. After I left, the whole thing burnt to the ground. I think, what the heck? You know, I know, I just wasn't in it. That was the main thing. We've had fire alarms go off. Uh, you know, just alarms go off. Going to start one meeting and all the power shuts down immediately. And everyone is in a, just in a frenzy because it's a high-tech church and they pride themselves on high-tech and it's all crashed. Uh, transport. I've had accidents. Had all kinds of things happen. Now, I never get hurt. There's never anything really serious. It's just a lot of inconvenience and confusion and... Every, it, it, emails go missing, communications get confused. You, you know, all of this stuff is a part of the warfare that I have. Not the least feeling, you know, I get broken nights sometimes, I can't sleep, uh, get troubled in the spirit, you know, get all the stuff. This is all part of the warfare. So if it happens to you, you're not weird, it's just part of what goes on. It's just, we are being hindered. That's all, hindered. Not stopped, just hindered. Just life's made a bit more difficult to grow a bit of toughness in you. That's all it is. But there's been quite a bit of it. I remember, I, mean, I had some stuff. I would not get sidetracked. <laughs> the stories are so funny. I remember lining up in, 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 in one of the five-star hotels in one of the big church in Singapore. And, and they, 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 <laughs> they, 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 they were waiting in there and the car broke down. And so they said, look, it's okay. The car, we, car's broken down. We've got a reserve car because we know this happened last time. So the, then they ring up. So the reserve car's got a flat tire. We're going to have to take a taxi. We're really sorry, Pastor. And so the next year I come back. I said, how's the car thing going? It's okay. We've got a new Audi. We've taken in for inspection. It'll be here to pick you up. 
we get the Audi turns up and they say, oh, we're sorry, Pastor. The window has just suddenly dropped inside the door. There's no air con. It's going to be very hot getting to the church. Now, all of this stuff goes on. See, it's like, hmm? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so I pray over the ministry time. So I've, I've started to do that a lot more now. So to pray over the ministry time means to stand in your authority. And it means to bring all of the ministry to the blood of Jesus Christ to be covered and, that, and to, uh, to ask the Lord to make sure no retaliation takes place. So very simple. Father, I just come to you. We bring this ministry time to you now. We ask, Lord, you conceal what we're doing from the spirit realm. We bring it all under the blood of Jesus Christ. And we ask, Lord, you set angels about us to ensure no retaliation from the spirit realm. Pretty simple, isn't it, eh? So, so again, you have to remember all that. What was that prayer? Pray it again. Oh, listen, get the idea. You, you Let it flow from your heart. It'll have conviction. All you've got to do is get the general thing to be covered and protected from retaliation. That's it. You pray your own prayer. Now listen, you think, well, I don't know how to pray prayers as fancy as you do. Don't worry. God catches the faith in your heart. It's your faith that gets the results, not getting the prayer right. That's the problem. We won't get the prayer right. Good. No, I'm not worried about the prayer. Again. I'll get the best I can and may deal the main things and God will sort it out. He understands the cry of the heart. Okay, you know, so we pray the prayer, cover the protection. Now I tell them this, so we make the prayer now of pronouncing a faith, their faith confession. Father, I come, Father and I come to you in Jesus' name. I confess Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ from every curse, every, every sin, every evil spirit. I belong to you, body, soul, and spirit. Now, it's just a positioning because if the demons start arguing to me, he belonged to me, which they do. Then I've already, we've got a confession of faith already. We're in unity. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, what Jesus did, and by the word of our testimony, and that's what we've done. We've come to the cross, come to the blood, come to the covenant, come to stand in that place in the witness stand. This is who I am. Okay? And then we lead them simply through your Father in Jesus' name. I just repent of doing this and this and this. Now, I change the order of this because if I'm dealing, so if I then release forgiveness. Father, from my heart, I forgive this person. I forgive them. I release them from all debt. Lord, I withdraw all judgments against them. I break every inner vow and renounce every. So I'm walking through those R's. So if you know that that's the process, you can change the order. So if I'm dealing with a generational thing, I'd start and start the same thing profession of faith. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. And blah, 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 blah. Now, Father, I stand as a representative of our family. And I confess to you the sins of our family. We have sinned against you. We have been involved in Freemasonry, been involved in spiritism, divinity, done all of these things. Father, I come and bring these sins to the cross. And I ask for you to forgive us, to cleanse us by the blood of Jesus, and remove all judgments against us. See? Simple. Now, I forgive the family members who opened the door to all of this to happen. And if I've been doing the same thing now, I repent of doing these things myself. Now, that's the dynamic for how I would deal with something generational. I need to get all the words right. It's basically understanding I'm a family member. Here I am. I'm fronting up to the cross with what we've done. And now I'm asking now for the blood to cover us, for it to be cleanse us, and for the judgments to be removed so we can have freedom. And I forgive the family members who opened the door. Oh, by the way, I did some too, so I repent of that. I break all agreements with that. So again, I'm flowing through this thing of the confession of faith, the repenting, the, the forgiving, the renouncing, and then finally the resisting. So I use the, the, the R's as the, the basis or framework for the prayer and then just alter the, 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 the language of it or whatever is appropriate. So, and that's how I do it. See, so then we come right at the end. Now, and so you've done through all of that part, and then we'll come to the end. And say, now, Father, in Jesus' name, I claim freedom. I claim freedom. So get them to say that. 
Now, I also command them to resist. I tell them to resist the spirits. In Jesus' name, I speak to each spirit which used this situation to come into my life. I command you, go now. So I like them all to do that. And you'll find I'll do it when I lead people through a big corporate prayer. First, you'll notice I get them to prepare their heart. It's a private issue. Then we pray a corporate prayer, which involves confession of faith, and then the issue, and then command the spirits to go because this is your life your territory you enforce the you enforce this thing you stand up you fight now when I come to minister I'm now ministering in agreement with you we are on one page we are one with Christ on this matter and now we're enforcing Calvary so it's a lot easier to get people free the work has been done if there's been trauma, then I may have to pray into whole trauma situations. So again, if you've got a piece of paper in front of you and you've got the list, just plug away and take one issue at a time and deal with one issue. When that's all over, how are you doing? And do you need a rest or a break or anything like that? You know. And sometimes I had a list, but they couldn't get through it. They were exhausted after we did two. That's okay. It's just, and I felt the peace of God come and the girl just fell over and fell asleep. Oh, well, that's that. We'll do the rest another time. So what I thought was going to be one, mes- one session probably turned into three to get it all sorted out. That's okay. If it takes three, it takes three. In other words, you're flowing in relationship with the person and with the Holy Spirit. So, uh, so I asked them to share with me what they've experienced because it's important that they engage in the process with you. You want them to share how you're feeling. You feel free now. You feel okay. So then we've done all of that. Now we get to the ministry part. We actually see. So notice, notice my focus is on preparation. I put a major focus on preparation: the diagnosis of what the issues are, then the preparing of the heart, helping them understand the ministry, positioning themselves to break all legal rights and open the way for God to heal them. Then the ministry part starts. And then the ministry part starts. Whoa, we've got all time we got left here. Oh, still got a bit of time. That's good. Okay, then we talk a bit about the ministry part. Okay, now, the thing is, you, your deliverance is done by faith. You're not how loud you sound or anything like that. You've you actually got to exercise faith. And uh, it's always done by faith. It's, it's never a method. It's always by faith. You know, in Matthew 17, 19, Jesus said, they said, why couldn't we cast the demon out? It was your unbelief. You haven't got faith. This kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. In other words, a greater level of preparation and authority is needed for certain demons. So don't worry if you don't get it right, give it a go. You might be amazed what happens. So faith is expressed by verbal command. Your faith is expressed through words. You have to speak. Now, it's not how loud you speak. You can shout and lose your voice. So there's heaps of people do that. There are a lot of shouting. But all the noise doesn't make any difference. Either you've got authority or you haven't. You know, everyone knows the teacher that was yelling at all the kids. No one's listening. The more they yell, the worse it gets. Because they're not operating with authority. Everyone can pick that there's nothing in there. This is an empty shell. Nothing's going to happen. So, so you speak from within your spirit. Now, here's the thing that I have found very helpful. And uh, the Lord helped me understand this, and, uh, and, and I'll show it to you very, very simply. With, when, you, when you are exercising faith commands, the unusual part of it is it feels a little weird because you're talking almost into the air. Isn't that right? You notice that? And, and so it's sort of, oh, my God, is anything happening? And so there will be a warfare in your mind around that point. And that's when you'll feel, oh, nothing's happening. You'll hear in your head, nothing's happening. You'll literally hear, nothing's happening. And if you agree with it, nothing will happen. <laughs> you can't agree with that demonic lie. And so confusion will come. I've been amazed how many times I know the person. I know their name and I come to pray and I can't remember their name. Can't even remember now what they're praying for. What, what, what? Now that tells me witchcraft is operating. I need to clear the air and just pray and break that witchcraft and then get on with the business. Okay, so here's what I found. I found that focus is an important key for engaging with the spirit realm. Focus. You think about this. We, we just talk with, about people. If you're connecting with someone, so as we sit down to talk, now you've all would have had this experience, you're talking with someone and then suddenly they've switched off. You can feel a change. What did you feel? You actually felt something. 
So when, when you were talking and they were listening, there was a draw you could feel from within. Okay, and then the moment they switched off, suddenly there's no draw. You can tell they've switched off. Now, okay, now apply that to the spirit realm. If I want to, or just go back to the natural realm, if I want to then engage someone, I must focus my attention. It means don't let any distractions give you full attention. When you give your full attention, your spirit opens up and then you engage. When I share on worship, you'll understand how that works in worship as well. Okay, so if I, if I just now focus on Colleen, just look, and I engage her and just start to look in her eyes and start to give her all my attention, suddenly my spirit will begin to flow towards you like that. But if I just get distracted in my head and start to think about other things, there'll be a change in that dynamic immediately. You can feel it. That's on a natural level. Why is that? Because communication is a flow not just of words, but a flow from the heart. So if they shut off, you can feel it. Okay, so now bring it now to engagement with the demonic realm. When you pray, focus your attention. So you may, some people say, have your eyes open all the time. Okay, have your eyes open so you can watch what's going on. I tend to keep mine closed because when I close them, I'm focused now like I'm looking into the spirit realm, right into what's in that person. I'm now rising in my spirit through fixing my mind on them and on the, demon, on the demons in them. Now I'm fixing my mind and fixing my whole attention to deal with that thing that's in there. And I don't speak to it. I break that soul tie. I see it like cords. I'm breaking it. See, I break that generational curse. Put the sword of the Spirit and cut it off in Jesus' name. So, so use language that expresses a spiritual prophetic activity. I cut off this. I break that. I command spirit of infirmity. Come out in Jesus' name. Now, it's, it's, you'll find if you'll focus your attention, there seems to be a greater flow come from within you. And uh, it, it just its quite remarkable to see it in action, really. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, you can help me, Dan. You can, you, you can be my helper here. Just come and stand there. Just stand over here like that. Okay, just someone get behind them, just in case something happens. <laughs> Need to catch you. Okay then, so, so I want to engage. So to engage, I must give my attention. So if my attention's scattered, I'm not engaged. So when I'm getting into spiritual confrontation with the demon, you can do it with your eyes open, but you're looking not at the person so much, you're just looking right into what's there. And when you look into what's there, the demons know it. They know you're onto them. And, and they feel, when, when they look at you, they see the fire, the life of God. They're intimidated by it completely. So you look straight into the eyes. When you look into the eyes, you're looking straight into what's in there. So I'm not just looking on the outside. I'm looking actually in. It's just a ch- focus on what's in there. So the eyes are the window of the soul. Or I look into, the, into this part of their life, and I'll just speak into it with focused attention. When I do that there will be a flow of something and immediately the demons get stirred. Then they know I'm onto them. They may resist, they may lie low for a little while. But I'll, I'll just show you, if I just give them a hand. Mm. Now, so, 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 so connecting like this, just taking the person's hand. And if I was just to fix my attention on the Lord, and then I begin to release the power of God. So there was not much, I didn't have to touch him in that sense of, it was just the power of God just came on him. So what it was, was I fixed my attention on the Lord and become conscious of him first. And out of that place, release power. I'll say that again. I fixed my attention on the Lord first. And out of that connection and union and awareness of him, then release power. You don't have to be too much of a hurry. This is, this is actually, we're bringing heaven to earth where the gateway through which power flows so your own where you, you your own sensitivity to the holy spirit is really important and when we get to worship i'll show you how you need to practice in your daily life building conscious that god awareness that god is with me so when you come to minister to people you're not sort of all afraid or suddenly where's god come back again we'll try one more time well, why not? He, he, he came here to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm a cheap date, trust me. <laughs> Hi, cheap date. <laughs> he 
He says he's a cheap date. <laughs> we, need to get, we need to get that low, that, rege- that low esteem. We need to get rid of that. <laughs> so, so Jesus felt power flow out of him. So most of us are looking for something from somewhere. We're often looking for out there somewhere. You are the minister of God. You are the gate to the realm of the spirit. So what's going to flow is going to flow through you. So you must then be focused. Focus means I just give my attention. And the first place I fix my attention on is in the Lord, so I'm engaged and sensitive to him. And as I fix my attention and become aware of him, it's out of that place, then I can begin to flow. And power can flow strongly or it can flow very gently. So when I'm doing deliverance, then I'll obviously move strongly. And so... You speak from your spirit. Don't just mumble words from here. You mumble words from here, nothing's going to happen. But if in my spirit I rise up, because I've been praying in tongues, I've been aware of the presence of God. So just right now, I'm just fixing my mind that God is here. Now as I become conscious of him, power, the power will flow. There you go, stay down. We'll shoot you again. <laughs> Now, so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to show you about the flow of power because you need to get the feel that power will flow through me. You need to believe power will flow through me. See, most people, they're not living conscious of that. They're just trying to get a method or something. But actually, you are connected one with Christ and out of that union and your faith allows the power to flow through to impact the person. So we're operating by faith in the power of God. You can operate in the anointing. That's a different flow. And when the glory comes and God's doing it all, that's the most wonderful when that happens. Just it's all taken off everywhere and you're just watching it happen. But the rest of the time we have to do our stuff. So focus your attention. And as you focus your attention and make commands, you expect something to happen. So the command, you don't use a lot of words when you're commanding. Don't pray long prayers. Don't pray, oh God, don't go into that long prayer stuff. This is very simple. Come out. It's a strong, direct command. Come out. Loose. It's very simple commands with expectation for something to happen. And, I'm, and, and I watch the person, how they're responding, and then encourage them to breathe out, encourage them to cough. And uh, sometimes as you start that process, you'll feel a massive resistance. And that resistance is a spirit resistance. So when you feel that spiritual resistance, keep praying. And if nothing seems to shift, then address it directly. It could be witchcraft, which is control over the person. They've been in, a, in, in agreement with witchcraft so long that they, 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 the thing is holding them and there's no freedom to actually respond. Or it could be unbelief because they've been deeply rejected. And so there's nothing happening because... Actually, in their heart, they're so in agreement with unbelief that they can't believe God will do anything for them. So I've had many times I've had that happen. I had a lady come up to me in a meeting. She's run up and she stood in the way when I'm trying to get out, block the way. Pastor, pray for me. And I said, I said, what, what do you want prayer for? She said, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm thinking, oh, I need to explain how to receive. It's, it's not just pray, you know. And so I felt, I just need to do it. So I I said, okay then. And then she added this. Oh, many great men of God have prayed for me and never got spirit and speak in tongues and never got slain in the spirit. And I'm I'm hearing many great men of God have gone before me and failed. And now it's my turn to fail. That's what I heard. And, and, And you go through this thing. In a moment, you've got to make up your mind what you do. And I said, Holy Ghost, help me. Right now, help me. And I got the answer straight away. I said, well, first of all, I want to congratulate you and honor you that having been prayed for by so many people so many times, you have come back again risking further rejection. I want to honor you that you've persevered. I said, in God's eyes, you've got faith in your heart, and he honors that faith and perseverance. That's the first thing. So the second thing is, God wants you to have it, and you want to have it. Nothing's happening. I'm not going to pray till we discover what the block is, because there's a block. There's not a block of God giving and not a block of you wanting. The block is of you receiving. 
So she said, the most common reason for that, and then the Lord gave me a word, not, is, is that there's a deep wound in the heart of rejection, and rejection attracts the spirit of unbelief. So you believe God can do things for people, but not for you. And I said, do you have an issue with your father? And she said, yes, I do. I said, well, then I want you now to forgive him, renounce your agreement with rejection and unbelief. So she just prayed some quick prayer. Did it? I just laid hands on her head and said, now in Jesus' name, rejection, unbelief, go. That was it. No manifestation, nothing. I said, now, I want you to hold my hand. I'm going to pray for you. Here's how you receive. I said, this is what you've been like. I said, you've been like a door's all closed up in your heart, fearful of being hurt again. So here's what I want you to put your hands over your head like that. So she did it. And I said, now I'm going to lead you through a prayer. When I get to the end of the prayer, I want you to do three things. One, open your arms like that, like you're opening your heart to receive. Two, take a deep breath to receive the gift of God. And three, speak in tongues. So anyway, we did that. So we got the end of the prayer, led her through the prayer, step by step. Ba, 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 ba. I said, now receive. And she went, came on her she began to speak out loud in tongues and fell over I had to grab her and she pulled me over I, on top of her in the end thinking this is not a good way to end a meeting but it's, <laughs> holy ghost calm and give him more so so there was a movement of the holy ghost it was extraordinary extraordinary and I realized that it was just the blockage the blockage you remove the block and the person receives. So be aware if you're ministering, there's a block. Now, what about manifestations? Oh, I love them. <laughs> the bigger and the broader, the better. Jesus never hid from it. He never tried to hide the stuff because it's visible to people the reality of what's going on, a conflict between heaven and earth and heaven's winning. See, and the, and the demon, demons are obviously now exposed. They're out in the open. And the reality that the God we serve is a great God and demons are in terror of him is evident. See, that's why I don't mind if it's out in front. People say, oh, no, 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 look, they get all pastoral. This is not a time to be like that. This is a time to be governmental when you're dealing with demons. So, I mean, I don't make sure people aren't humiliated or embarrassed. I'm careful with my language with people when I'm praying for them to not disclose all that I know may be there, just to use language that is vague to people listening but is very specific to the demons because I'm focused on them. So... <clears throat> Yeah, so come on. So what happens? Well, they do manifest. They'll manifest through the mouth, manifest through the eyes, manifest through the hands, manifest through the body. All kinds of things happen. So sometimes they'll cough violently. Sometimes they burp. I had a burp the other day. Every time I commanded, burp, burp. There's a woman too. I've never, I mean, women don't normally do that. And this is burp, burp. You know, and she burped all the way home. She, the deliverance carried on after we'd finished. So sometimes you get burping. And Hard not to laugh at some of these things. I have to be honest. It's hard for me to hold together. <laughs> Sometimes they growl. <laughs> they snarl like that. Snarl at me. And, and, uh, and sometimes they'll, they'll threaten. I kill you. So really? You know, and uh, oh, they say, who are you? They'll challenge you. So they may challenge your authority. I come against you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who defeated you at Calvary. Look at the cross and the blood, you demon. And yeah, just quite dramatic. Just give it to them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, who are you? Well, I'll tell you who I am. Yeah. I'm your conqueror in Jesus' name. You know, you can't be intimidated by them. They, oh, they had, well, they'll threaten, they'll threaten. And, and I said, I had before, I've had them come up and crush things and come up to try and choke me, but they never get anywhere. They just never get anywhere. So don't be intimidated. Just rise inside because you have a warrior anointing on you. See, you pray for that warrior spirit that's called the spirit of might. So I pray that over my life on days too. Okay? The spirit of might is upon me. Today, Lord, fill me with might in the inner man by the Holy Ghost. Why would you not want that? That's what's given. It's for war. That's why David never, never lost. Why Samson overcome his enemies. They had a spirit of might on them. It's a mighty warrior anointing. The Lord is a warrior. Time the church realized he's a warrior. Our, our battle's not against the flesh and blood. So you're not being aggressive with people. It's being assertive in the spirit realm. And we want to learn to rise up inside. You know, it's not a personality thing. It's actually to do with the spirit of might that gets stirred. You know, and wants to do something. 
It, when, when it comes on, you're my, my, my. Somebody stop me. <laughs> We're going to take down the walls. <laughs> It's, it's an anointing that can come on you. Now, it can be very quiet. I mean, it doesn't have to be dramatic. I'm just telling you some stories, see, just in case it happens to you. And, uh, and so I've had some that yell and they scream and some have roared like lions. Some of uh, some, their tongue goes in and out like a serpent. You can't do it naturally. It's unnatural. So, uh, some of them, their eyes will roll up and all you see is the whites of their eyes. It's like, whoa, where'd the eyes go? That looks like a zombie. Shoot it in the head quickly. You know, no. Sorry, uh, stop watching movies. <laughs> Put your hand on them. Pray in Jesus' name. It's an occult spirit. So when you've got occultic spirits, they're quite reactionary, and you'll often get the distortions, the serpent things. By the manifestations, you can often recognize them. It's witchcraft. The person's hands will become like claws. They'll become like an old witch. <laughs> and they, it's, you look at it, you see exactly what it is. And so you know then to, uh, to name it then. And uh, so you can get sometimes they've got unclean spirits, they'll shake their hands like crazy. You know, it's like there's something dirty attached. Sometimes they jump up and down. I've had them jump up and down. I've had them fall down. I've had them levitate. Oh man, that was something. Had them levitate off the ground. Now, it's impossible to do. This guy's lying on the ground. He's got someone sitting on holding his feet down, and his whole front went straight up like that. Everyone went, whoa, look at that. And then pray in Jesus' name. Boom, down he gone. So, so, so I've had them levitate. What else? I had one try to climb a wall. He was like, he, you know, like a, like a cockroach. He got on the ground and he went like a bug. All across the floor, right up, up the wall. Unbelievable. And uh, I had another one like a dog. And he all the way around until he got around and he got in front of me and he, he fell down like he was dead. But he wasn't dead. He was just manifesting and the demon had gone. It's just unusual, the stuff that happens. It's so exciting. Another one there, and again, it's occult stuff. And he fell on the ground, and he, he went under the chairs like a snake. He went wiggly like a snake. I, I can't even, if you see a snake wiggle, that's what he did. I don't know how people can do it. They can't do that. It's, not, it's unnatural. Oh, I had another one. I had another one. He was in a brethren church, this one. He asked me to bring the Holy Ghost. I started to testify and share before I even got to preach. And this guy started, he was holding his chair, started to bounce up and down. And he bounced up and down. Everyone's now looking at him. Then he bounced into the middle of the aisle. And then I said, oh, to Dave was with me, my son. So he gave, go pray for him. Next thing, the guy bounces all the way to the back, then got up and run around. They were in a brethren church. And there's a young man running around the church now with my son in pursuit. <laughs> After that, they all got filled with the Holy Ghost. The whole church changed. It was amazing. It's amazing. So these things happen. You know, sometimes their face distorts and, and so on. They fall down, <laughs> all kinds of things. Sometimes they just look like they're dead. And sometimes they fight like a crazy person. And that's a little tricky to manage when they fight like a crazy person. Now they have unusual strength. And I, <laughs> I, was in, I won't tell you who the church was. But I went to a church in New Zealand. They had all the leaders, a very fine church, well-to-do church. Well, I said to them, Sometimes things happen. It would be quite good in this five-star hotel to shut the door. No, 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 no. This is from wherever they were. And uh, anyway, when the Holy Ghost fell on them all, it was like a crazy stuff happened. People were shouting. We had one woman, and she was a little bit deformed in her body. She threw five men around, just like that. And then someone else shouted, F you, F you. They ran out of the building yelling their head off, and I could see the security doing... I thought this was a church meeting. I said, I, I look, I've, I've had all of this kind of stuff happen. It didn't worry me at all. I just think, oh, man, God, it's amazing. Bring them back. I said, they'll be back. They'll come back. They won't be able to, you know, I've had some people go out, you know, and come back and got prayed for. And I said, what happened? He said, he said well, I didn't believe in any of this stuff. And then I said, <laughs> this is what the guy said. I didn't believe in any of this stuff. Then I asked myself, why am I sitting here screaming in the toilet? <laughs> I, should, I should go back into the church. <laughs> I remember I was in, in, uh, in, in a hotel in Singapore. We had a great move of God going. And, and they had people stand in the, 
oh, I had so many things manifest wildly there. Like I remember just being sitting in the restaurant and looking at a guy and suddenly he just screamed out loud up the table and it was all on in the, in the restaurant. And then, then they had a group of people in the foyer shouting my name. And, and so, so the, the, the pastors, they got a great idea. Isn't this a great idea? Let's put Pastor Mike in a secret hotel. Where no one knows. So they found the secret hotel. I thought, this is great. Oh, secret hotel. This is very, felt very important. Secret hotel. About one in the morning, I hear bang, 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 yell, yell, shout outside my door. It's someone outside manifesting. And I woke up, oh, what, what? oh my goodness. Someone's found me. But of course, it was just another person in the hotel manifesting. That's all. He just happened to pass the door and start to manifest. That was all it was. That was in a season when the, the anointing was very strong. That was done by the anointing, not by faith. For most of us, the deliverances are very quiet and calm. There may be no major expression of any kind, but the person afterwards feels an amazing peace. They feel a rest. They feel often they just want to just go to sleep. They just feel like a weight has come off them. Uh, they find that the voices have stopped. The noise in their head has stopped. They feel the pains have gone out of their body. And many things you didn't pray for just change. It's just an amazing thing to see it happening. God is so good. God is so good. So what happens if nothing happens? Oh, well, that's happened heaps of times. <laughs> the big thing is do not get into an introspection thing or feel condemned or disempowered by this. This is just your learning journey. And because one doesn't work, doesn't matter. Focus on what God does and what God is doing, not on what didn't happen. And, and so uh, sometimes we just, uh, after you've prayed and made some commands, you may feel uh, like, oh, nothing's happening, nothing's happening. So just inquire, what are you feeling? Is there anything happening inside? Dialogue with the person. Or say, listen, I think we need to pray. There seems to be some resistance, so we just begin to pray until we feel something start to move. Then I pray again. Sometimes I've had to get them to break their agreement with unbelief just to get the freedom. So again, it's like, you can't come up with a list of answers for every possible question. You just give the main principles of how to work with the Holy Ghost in this area. So I just ask him, what do I do now, Holy Ghost? What do we do now? How do we deal with this? What is there? Uh, sometimes if the demon is resisting and difficult, especially in a bigger meeting, if there's a bigger meeting, which most of you won't be taking, be mainly privately, but if it's a bigger meeting, you have to really plan the ministry team and how it will contain and manage manifestations that may happen in a big meeting. Uh, and you go to some places, it's very, very powerful meetings, very, very strong presence, just because of the, 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 what's been built in the church. Other places you go, it's like cracking nuts. It's hard, it's hard, you know, but still things happen. So we go by faith, not by sight. So don't focus on manifestations. People can be freed without manifestations. Right. If, we're, if I've got large numbers and someone's violent, I usually have teams trained how to just hold them so they don't fresh around everywhere and sit them down so we can just pray for them on the ground. You have to discern. Sometimes there's a massive reaction which is trauma-based, not necessarily demonic per se when it's demonic it looks ugly the face contorts or it's get body you can look and think that's probably demonic because the holy spirit quickens that to you but when it's uh, trauma sometimes a lot of emotions come up and the person may be very angry or cry it's very important you treat them carefully because you don't want them re-traumatized that's coming up now now you need to stop and now maybe take them into a, bit, a quiet place and just talk about the trauma they're going through and how you'll minister to that but for most of us our ministry is done quietly it's done privately there's not necessarily a lot of drama I have a little bit every now and then you know it just happens and there's shouting so the neighbors get a bit used to the shouts and screams and wonders what goes on in the pastor's house <laughs> That's it. people come in and they, there's massive changes in them after they've come out and they, they're quite different so uh, 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 when you finish praying for the person pray for the Holy Ghost to fill them and just to bring healing to the parts that are broken and damaged you do need to pray for that peace of God to come the healing to come and just so that they're left in a very good state you may want to give them a hug uh, but then again, they don't always want to be hugged. So it's just, it's sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Then we would talk with them a little bit about how to keep their freedom. And, uh, and uh, I'll share that in another session.
So anyways, I've probably gone over time now. Have we gone? Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll do some questions then. All right then. Um, I was just wondering, I was just wondering if you could uh, repeat when someone says to you, I, I, I can't feel the Holy Spirit, I've never received the Holy Spirit, the, the, the root is often rejection. And what did you ask that, what did you get that woman to do again? Okay. Throw her arms sure, open. Sure. So when someone is hungry for the Holy Spirit has been prayed for a number of times, there's a block. You've got to discern what the block is. So here's what the block could be. The common block is rejection coupled with unbelief. That's a common one. Another common block is intellectualism, where the persons come from a highly educated background coupled with unbelief. Another uh, common one is doctrine, where they've been exposed to doctrine against the Holy Ghost. They've actually been in that environment, which is something like that. And there's also an antichrist spirit uh, against the Holy Ghost and unbelief with it. So those are common ones. Sometimes there's massive fear and control in the person, and so they won't let go and yield. And so you may have to then do healing ministry of some kind before you can address the issue of getting them filled with the Holy Ghost. They have to learn to surrender uh, and open their heart for the Holy Ghost to help them remove whatever pain has caused this fear and, and their agreement with control as a way of managing the pain. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so we'll go back to the lady again. So I'm just giving you a few scenarios of where blocks take place. And, uh, and then, of course, if someone's been prayed for a number of times, but there was poor instruction. I find often there's very poor instruction. And that's why when that, so I said when the lady said, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, I'm stopping thinking, I never pray without instructing how to receive. And so I'll just, if, if I'll cover that. So here's what I did with that particular lady. We identified that she'd been rejected by her father. I asked her to forgive her father and break her agreement with rejection and unbelief. Forgive, because that's the pain is sitting in there. You stand praying, you want something, forgive. So if she's wanting something from God, forgive. Forgive. Now, it may be superficial level, but it suffices for that point. It's just she's taken a stand and made a decision to forgive. Then break the agreement. In Jesus' name, I break all agreement with unbelief and rejection. I choose to believe and receive what you have for me. So just a simple prayer like that. And then just command the Spirit, those things to go. They will go very quick. But it doesn't mean there's deep healing around that area. It just means the blockage to the Holy Ghost is removed at that point. So I find that sort of stuff, is, it goes really easily. And uh, then I lead them through the prayer to receive. So the guy who'd have false doctrine, uh, okay, you've received false doctrine. It is now uh, brought to, uh, to a bondage around your life of an antichrist spirit and unbelief. So we just need to now pray a simple prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I renounce all agreement with teaching against the Holy Spirit. See? I renounce it now. I forgive those who brought it to me. I, re I renounce my agreement with the spirit of antichrist and unbelief. You see, it's like, it's all just those same hours. It's just how you apply them in there. See? And then they're ready to receive. So... Uh, so, so those things. Now, and then in leading the person, I just give them uh, a couple of scriptures. Uh, it depends how much time I've got. And so, if it's a real, got to be do it quick, I'll give them uh, Mark 11, 24, 25. And, and it says, Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. So, I say, here's the first thing. Number one, desire. You must really want this gift. Number two, you must pray and ask specifically for it. Number three, whatever things you desire when you pray, believe. You must make a decision to believe that God will give it to you right at that moment. So as you're praying, you're praying not, well, I'll see what God will do, but praying, believing you'll receive. And then three, receive the gift. And finally, express the gift. That's how I tell them. Just do it. There it is off that scripture. This promise of the Holy Spirit is not just for you, for your children, for all who are far off. If you come and ask the Father for a gift of the Holy Spirit, he won't give you a stone or a serpent. He'll give you that gift. So I just give them a little bit. I want to build their faith for it. Then I say, now here's how we're going to do it. And I tell them the how to receive. Here's the principle, now the how to. I said, I will lead you through a prayer. I want you to follow me in the prayer. In the prayer, we will go through those steps of that Mark uh, chapter 11. At the end of the prayer, I want you to do these things. I want you to take in a deep breath 
and receive the gift of God and then to pray aloud in the language of the Spirit. It'll come from your belly up, but you must speak. God will not make you speak. They spoke as the Holy Spirit gave them the utterance. So we were clear instructions. And then I say, if we're in a big crowd, I tell them that everyone around you is going to pray out at the same time so you feel, don't feel embarrassed by these different sounds that are coming. It is a language of praise. Then I lead them with a prayer. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Now, notice I'm praying point by point through that Mark 11. I want to receive the Holy Spirit. I want the gift of tongues. I ask you to baptize me in the Spirit now. Because you've promised, I believe and I receive now the baptism in the Holy Ghost and the gift of tongues. See? Whatever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. Now, Lord, I receive that gift in Jesus' name and I praise you with all my new language. And then I tell them right now, take a deep breath in. And I lay hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost. And we all begin to pray in tongues. I sometimes and release the power of God on them, and then, boof, away they go. Most times you get out of, a, out of maybe 100, we'll get usually maybe about 94, something like that. I get high rate of people come through. And there's a the few that'll just stand there, <laughs> they stand there like this. They're, they're waiting for something to happen. They're waiting to feel something. And I mean, you're not going to do it. It's not by feeling. This is by I have received the gift. I will now operate by faith. I let it flow up from. And I said, fix your mind on the Lord and just be thankful to Him and then let it flow from within. Now, are there, we don't get 100%. Now, initially, when I started praying and moving with God, I would focus, because I was trained as a, as a science, I used to focus on everything that wasn't going right. It doesn't go well when you do that. So I had to change my thinking. Listen, don't worry about when it doesn't work right. Focus on what God is doing, not what is not doing. Keep your focus on what he's doing and declaring what God is doing. And are there some that don't get through? Yes, there are. And, and I don't always have the time to help them find that out. It's really a local church issue, that one. And there will be blocks for some reason or lack of understanding or lack of just surrender. Okay, we better finish now. God bless you. Thank you, Mike. That's just well, fa absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Very, very good. Excellent. So uh, we're having a break now. We'll be back here. Um, so we're a calf, calf, Earth to Calf.